That's a Christmas truck if I ever saw one, right? Merry Christmas. And you know what that means? That means starting up your cars to let the batteries charge. Headlight over there, headlight over there. All those cowboys and, you know, soldiers and warriors, they didn't ride no donkey. Donkey! They rode a steed, particularly a steed. Why? Have balls, man, have balls. And that's why these cars are important. That's why they will live on forever. We're not gonna be riding no electric donkey. <laughs> Welcome to Rep Roaring Garage, I'm Alex, and this is a channel where you get your weekly dose of car culture, mechanical tips, and a hefty dose of good old fashioned cheesiness. Yeah. Merry Christmas, those of you that celebrate it and don't skip ahead. This episode, I really want to talk about something that's kind of pervasive on YouTube and TikTok and other platforms. When they talk about the different kinds of car guy, they always split it up in terms of American cars, muscle cars, land yachts, imports, German cars, but they miss really what's the dividing factor. And if you're one, can you not be into another? Number one, the modern. You might think that this is, okay, that's low hanging fruit, but think about it. It's not restricted by any kind of brand. You're not doing this out of necessity. They're doing it out of that desire to push it to the limit. Let me see if I'm smart enough to figure out if I can squeeze that much more power, that much more handling or whatever out of a car where engineers figured out that it's done. We don't need to do anymore. A brief history about the modding scene, we're gonna have to go back to the great generation. Boomers were just being born. We're talking about those that fought in World War II. They come back, they're stressed out, they saw their buddies die, they won a war. A lot of them didn't even like the leadership on our own side and the things that were happening. So they got into motorcycles and cars. There were a lot of 30s cars that were just sitting there, perfectly fine automobiles, but slow. They took all that army know-how, navy know-how, and applied it and bam, you get the hot rod. To this day, that imagery persists, flames on the side. That's where also the um, outlaw mentality comes in. The governments and um, hoity-toity people were telling them to stop and whatnot, and they were like, hell no, we're gonna keep on doing our thing, we're gonna be loud, we wanna be free. We're not bothering you, so why are you bothering us? And we find ourselves in a very similar situation now with EPA and uh, freaking armed IRS. The second is the restorer. The restorer is somebody that will take a car like this and bring her back to life. Repair, replace, but ultimately the goal is to try to preserve as much of the original components as possible. I am going to lump in, in the restorer slash maintainer, it's kind of the same mentality. It just depends on what your starting point is. You could have something like my Ranchero that was a basket case, or you can have a car that just was neglected. It's mostly complete, like my 72. Needed, you know, push rods, tune-up, tires, some bushings, minor things. Now, obviously, there's the whole ship of Theseus arguments. Like, at what point is that car still original? If you replace absolutely everything, every component and you were to take those old ratty components and build them into another car, which one is the original? This can also apply to us humans, like our cells get replaced. Are we the same person? You know what? Let's duke it out in the comments because I find this kind of philosophy interesting. Nobody should say car guys and gearheads that were stupid. <laughs> you know, we do read. <laughs> The third guy is going to be the preserver. Preserver is one that probably doesn't get talked about a lot. They're just as critical to the car ecosystem as the other two guys. The preserver will take a car like this and they won't modify it. They'll barely drive it and they'll keep everything original for the most part. Some may even go as far as keeping mileage down. Like my last video, the five things, you know, keep the original floor mats unmolested on top. Can I use any words on YouTube anymore without problems? 
you get my idea. Now, they're more like curators of an art piece. They will dedicate a lot of energy and time, and they'll try to figure out the best ways to preserve a car, to keep its paint fresh, the interior, the leather feeling supple. Boobie. And this is how you end up with a car 40 years, 50 years down the line, a barn find that looks amazing. There's so many cars that keep popping up that got like, you know, 20 miles on them. <sighs> Don't tell me that you're not amazed at some of those cars. Like, wow, this is bringing me back when you see one of those GNXs or even it could be, it could be a Ford Escort. Now, of course you could say the builder, the restorer and all that, but problem with that is it's a one-time event, at least from the car's point of view. Now we may do multiple cars and so on, but the car itself gets restored once. After that, it falls into one of the three categories of car people that whatever they'll do to it. Somebody could take that restored car and make it a resto mod. Somebody could just maintain it and keep it as it was in its original restored state. Just keeping up with wear items, have all the documents and paperwork to show how original the car is, even though it's had a restoration. And of course, the same could apply that after the said restoration, that car could sit for 40 years. Somebody could just to care for it and visit it in the garage, start it up or do whatever it needs for that thing to survive as new as possible. Now you may be thinking, one of these is me. The other two, nah, that's not real work or whatever. Here's where I'm going to disagree. I personally kind of fall under the maintainer, mostly. But each one of these has a distinct challenge. There's effort. There's work being done. You have to think. You have to kind of plan, figure out what strategy you're going to use to make it to whatever deadline goal you want to achieve. For some, that's how can I get 2,000 horsepower out of the Hellcat? engine. You'll lay it out. You'll think it through. You'll do your research. Let's say I want to drive this car. I want to put a 200,000 miles on it and I want to keep it as new, original. That's going to take work too. Stocking up on parts, things that you know will no longer be available. That's where you got to start scouring Craigslist, eBay, Facebook marketplace. You go to swap meets, you trade parts and that takes, you know, takes time, takes effort. Like my strategy was to inventory everything. So I keep track of it because you can lose things in a big basement in a garage and so on. And the preserver, he's going to have to think of like, where can I drive this car? You may put uh, scratches and rock chips on my nose. You may put a wrap, seat covers to protect the seats and so on. Where are you going to keep it? How are you going to keep it? Are you going to have to start it up? Do you have to do oil changes on the regular just to make sure everything is functional? Same with electrical stuff. Now I do have a checklist. What is your major malfunction, num nuts? A lot of you guys liked the uh, break-in checklist. I do have a couple of checklists as well. Obviously, I got them for the Hellcats and uh, Scat Packs. I also have them for, for early 70s Continentals, which do apply for a lot of early Ford cars and maybe some GMs and Panther platform cars, Crown Vicks, Grand Marquis, Town Cars. So again, hit me up at uh, Dakman at Directive25.com. I'm not overwhelmed. I'll let you know when I am. I'm just really stoked when I can help with a little bit of my OCD madness. Maybe you could be retrained, re Educated. Maybe help somebody out get into that pattern because we know there's going to be dark times ahead with Mopars. <laughs> I also want to add, you can modify these. These are not copyrighted, whatever. It's just a checklist. If you want to add items, go right ahead. I constantly update them. Maybe there's something I find out about these cars. Maybe there's a vulnerability with the windows where they get jammed. So I add a, a, an item that says cycle through the windows every time you do an inspection. And just a little bit of geeky geekiness here. I call them 3A, 3B. A is for after flight. 3B is before flight from the Air Force. But I count them not as a flight, as a C. Season. 3A is after the car show season when you're ready to put the car to bed and 3B is when you're getting ready to bring it out for the first time. It's spring, it's nice, it's been a couple of rains to wash off all the salt and bam, now you're ready to go. Each one of these categories applies to all of us, regardless of what kind of car guy you are. If you're a modder, you're a preserver too. If you put on a vinyl wrap, guess what? That's preservation. I'm all out of condom. Could you pick me up on if you go out? If you've hit that perfect tune, like the car's drivable, it's reliable, you've got tons of power and you've got hard pulls, you want to preserve that. Guess what? Now you're the maintainer. That means I solve problems. 
if you're the maintainer. Obviously, I'm gonna preserve my work. You saw the plastic cover. I got the dehumidifier to make sure there's no condensation under that tarp as being a preserver. I also have to modify. There's some things that you just can't find. You have to fabricate, you have to modify it. And even the preserver, they might have to modify something going from bias ply tires to radials, dual master cylinders versus single. There might be a recall. Bam, that's a modification. Now I will tip my hat to those guys that are so hardcore. Screw the recall. I'm keeping this original. There's a, a special kind of insanity that I like about people like that, but they will maintain it as well. Each of us have overlap with the other. And without one of us, we lose as a whole. I'm sharing my checklist. Years of me coming up with that kind of, you know, call it research, whatever, resulted in something that now benefits other people that might be inclined towards modding, towards preserving. We all share these ideas and we learn from each other. That's why we are a culture that stands on its own. We're car guys, we're gearheads, we're car nuts. Whatever name you wanna use or whatever car you like, we all have that appreciation. And I mean true car guys. I don't care about the internet 12 year olds that argue and this car is better than that and wh whatever. Until you actually get to experience that, you're putting in work, effort, be it labor, be it money, whatever it is, that's when you begin to appreciate somebody else's car. It doesn't matter what kind of car it is, it's that level of dedication that is recognizable to us. Much like two cowboys riding along and tip of the hat. This shit's work, it's hard, like anything else. That's why I'm here. For a moment, I was like, I don't want to put up a big tree. It's a hassle, it's money, but you know what? It's part of my tradition, part of my culture as, you know, being Romanian. Money's been tight. You guys know I bought a buttload of cars. Presents were a little bit, uh, you know, skimping, but I still got something. I still got something from mom. And am I a Christian if I don't do these things? That's another interesting question. The same with being a car guy. Are you a car guy if you don't preserve, maintain, modify, or any of these things? Can you be a car guy without a car? Let me know. I guarantee you there, there are viewers right now that maybe they don't have a car at all and they're saving money. That's Work. You're putting in work. The birth of the horseless carriage to muscle cars, to uh, race cars, to rally cars, whatever. We're not going without, without a fight. And that's part of what it means to be a man. Standing up and defending your family. So I'm Alex. This is Rip Roaring Garage, where oil is thicker than blood. Merry Christmas. And still hit me that like. <laughs> Let's make this quick as if it's a freaking quarter mile. <laughs> That's dumb. How can I get 12,000? That's a little much on my nose. Uh, not my nose, the car's nose. Earlier cars, 60s cars with the single piston, with the single, uh, with the single brakes, uh, with the master cylinder that has just one uh, chamber. It's not chamber. The master cylinder that only has uh, one, uh, what's the, I can't think of the word. 